Hello, and welcome to another webinar presented by Access. And we're very happy to have you as part of this webinar. Access is a firm believer in continuing training, and we create content that you can access anywhere, anytime, to help you succeed and grow your business. Now, before we begin, I'd like to give you a little background about Access. Access is a technology company that provides innovative solutions to health organizations to effectively run their business. Now, we empower healthcare organizations like yours with easy to use cloud based software that integrates all aspects of your operations so you can improve patient outcomes while growing your business. We're the fastest growing home health technology company in the country today, trusted by more than 6,000 healthcare organizations. Over 150,000 users log in daily, serving over 1 million patients nationwide. The most successful home health care organizations trust Access. Access has achieved many firsts in the industry. Now, we're the only healthcare technology company approved to award continuing education units, CEUs by the American Nurses Credentialing Center, and also the most recommended home health care software by Software Advice. Now, we're the only company to have a native mobile app that works on both Apple and Android devices. And Access is the first software company approved to provide CAP services. Now, as promised, let's start today's webinar. Hello again, this is Jennifer Gibson with Access. I am your presenter for the sixth part of our Navigating the Highway of ICD-10-CM. We're going to focus today on musculoskeletal and therapy coding. And I hope that you enjoy the presentation and learn what you need to know about coding these types of conditions in home health care. Our objectives today are to understand why proper coding is important, to learn who's responsible for applying and assigning diagnoses, to study guidance for common uh, musculoskeletal issues and how to code those in ICD-10, and to apply that knowledge to common home health scenarios that involve musculoskeletal and therapy issues. So the next few slides, we're going to focus on OASIS C1 guidance manual information on how to code and who's responsible for coding in ICD-10. However, if you want more in-depth coverage of this subject, as well as the general guidance and conventions for coding in ICD-10, you'll need to go back to part one of this 12-part series, because in part one, we really talk about in depth the OASIS guidance and the guidelines and conventions in general for OASIS and for ICD-10-CM. But according to the OASIS C1 guidance manual, the primary home health diagnosis should be the chief reason the patient is receiving home care. It's also the diagnosis most related to the current home health plan of care. And we're also told that only current diagnoses can be used for primary or secondary diagnosed conditions. The secondary home health conditions are noted in M1023, and those conditions are comorbid conditions that exist at the time of the assessment, they are actively addressed in the plan of care, or they have the potential to affect the responsiveness to treatment and rehabilitation prognosis. Now, according to the OASIS C1 guidance manual still, the selection of that primary and secondary diagnosis must be made by the assessing clinician. The assessing clinician has responsibility in so much as the clinician is expected to understand that patient's overall medical condition and the care needs of that patient before selecting the correct diagnoses. And then they also have to uh, select the diagnoses and sequence them according to acuity. Now, the assessing clinician's diagnoses will be based on three things, the assessment findings, the medical record, and input from the physician. So perhaps there's some information that's missing and they have questions about what's going on and what diagnosis should be used, then they would need to query and coordinate with the physician to get more information and document that. The assessing clinician should also record the primary and secondary diagnoses in M1021 and M1023 on the OASIS. The coder can then add the code after the assessing clinician has determined that primary and secondary diagnosis. So again, you may not know the code itself. You may not know if it's I10 or I12 or whatever, but you can put the primary and secondary diagnoses on the OASIS 
and sequence them according to the acuity and the primary reasons for home care, and then your coder will come in behind and add the diagnoses. And if you make attempts at putting diagnoses, the codes themselves, uh, the coder may actually counsel with you and let you know if there's some sequencing regulations that need to be followed and if or when they've made changes, why they have done so, and then you both communicate and sign off on that according to your agency's policy. So how do we get the right diagnosis to begin with? When trying to select the correct code, consider the following criteria. Number one, that code has to comply with coding guidelines, and this is according to your OASIS C1 manual. So in order to fill out an OASIS properly, we are told by CMS we must comply with the coding guidelines, and that's why it's so important that we study, as we're doing here, how to properly code according to ICD-10. We are also told to only code unresolved diagnoses. Once the diagnosis has been resolved, it's no longer uh, appropriate to code that problem. For example, if a patient has a knee replacement due to osteoarthritis and the knee replacement has been uh, cured or treated or resolved that diagnosis of osteoarthritis, we no longer code osteoarthritis in that knee. The same goes with cholelithiasis and cholecystitis after a gallbladder. We no longer, after I should say after a gallbladder removal, we no longer code that problem because it was resolved by surgery. We also know that we're to code only the relevant medical diagnoses. Just like we saw earlier on the slides, um, we are only to code those things that might impact our plan of care or their comorbid conditions or they're actively addressed. So if there's something the patient has that doesn't need intervention from the home health agency and it's not a comorbid condition that will uh, affect how the patient progresses with the home health treatment, then we don't need to code those things either. The correct codes should also be supported by the patient's medical record documentation. And by medical records, we mean the physician's medical records, not just the clinician's records. So that needs to match and, and match very well. Uh, we also need to comply with sequencing requirements such as are found with manifestation codes and as a matter of fact CMS points that out specifically that etiology and manifestation codes are sequenced and reported properly. That's something that we must do. We are also told to avoid nonspecific, ambiguous, or symptoms when possible. And we're really going to talk about that today because one of the things that we've seen in home care is that we use a lot of symptom codes when we're trying to uh, talk about why therapies in the case and justify the therapy services that we've included. But according to guidelines, we are not supposed to use nonspecific ambiguous or symptoms if it's at all possible. So we're going to really delve into that one today. The criteria for primary diagnosis, again, if you're going to put the diagnosis in M1021, the diagnosis should follow this criteria. Again, it's most related to the current plan of care. And if there's more than one diagnosis being treated and you're trying to decide which one should be primary, you're going to choose the diagnosis that represents the most acute condition and requires the most services, that would be the one that's assigned in the primary space. So it should be the chief reason for home health, it requires the most intensive skilled services, and it's not a Z code unless absolutely necessary. When selecting a secondary diagnosis, again, let's talk about the criteria for those items that are placed in M1023B through whatever letter you want to go through, um, we need to make sure that those are diagnoses that didn't meet the criteria for primary diagnosis, but it's still something that we are attending to for that patient. The diagnoses that are placed in secondary diagnoses slots are selected. Uh, those are addressed in the plan of care and affect the patient's responsiveness to treatment and rehabilitation. And then the list, as far as the B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on, that list of secondary diagnoses is listed in order that best reflects the seriousness of the patient's condition and then justifies the disciplines and services provided. Now, when you're learning to code, it's really, really important, but it also remains important even though you've been coding for years like I have, you need to always go back to your basics of coding 
and these are some general guidelines, you always, always start in your alphabetical index first. And if you have a code book, the alphabetic index is the very first part of the book that comes right after the guidelines and convention section. And uh, you're going to notice that there are incomplete codes in that alphabetic index. For example, a dash at the end of an entry in the alphabetic index means additional characters are needed to complete that code. You'll also see guidance such as C or C also, and that guidance should be taken as a command and not a suggestion because quite often when you see or see also, uh, there's either cross-referenced information or maybe there's a lot more information at the code it refers you to than there is at the original entry. So always double check the C and C also entries there. Once you have found the code that you suspect is correct in the alphabetic index, you then want to flip over in the tabular index and double check that code. Uh, and I always tell people, you know, best practice for me at least because I'm very visual is to write the code down real quick on a scratch piece of paper from the alphabetic index and then flip over in the tabular and follow that through and look and make sure it's the correct code. Now the tabular index is the second part of the book, the code book that you're using, and it will be broken down by chapters. Okay, so that's where you're going to double check and only in the tabular can you find the complete codes such as whether or not it needs a fifth or a sixth or a seventh character and where to choose the seventh character uh, is only found in the tabular index. So you can't get a complete code from the alphabetic index. Now when you're looking in the tabular index as well, you want to check for guidance. Often there's guidance at the chapter level, which means right at the beginning of the chapter title, there's some criteria or guidance that will apply to all the codes in that chapter. So you need to check there. You also need to check at the chapter block level. Quite often, uh, diagnoses are broken into blocks. That's usual for every uh, chapter that's in the tabular. And those chapter blocks uh, include disease processes that are similar. For example, in hypertension, in the cardiac, the hypertension block is I10 to I14. And those um, all those codes have similar guidance and that guidance is found at that chapter block level. So where you see the code title for I-10 to I-15, I believe it is, I think I said 14 earlier, but you'll notice there's guidance at that level that affects all the codes between I-10 and I-15. You'll also want to check for guidance at the three character category level. That's when you get down in talking about the code title such as I-12 and then underneath I-12, the codes are broken down further. But at I-12, quite often there will be, or at that three character category level such as I-12, there will be guidance that will affect all of the codes that follow. And then finally, you want to look for any conventions or guidelines that are found at the final code level. So when you get to the complete code, sometimes there will be guidance such as use additional code or code first. So you'll need to check in all of those places in order to code correctly. And this is why I also tell people that using mappings and gems and just a lookup service is not smart practice and it's not best practice because you won't get all of those pieces of guidance in a lookup unless you happen to be using the professional um, coding online that Decision Health has. Okay, so let's get into our musculoskeletal coding guidelines those that are specific for coding musculoskeletal and therapy problems in ICD-10. We're going to first talk about some changes that came into therapy coding with ICD-10. Um, coding those musculoskeletal conditions are a little bit different in ICD-10. We are now actually coding fractures rather than aftercare of the fractures. You're also going to see that there are not as many aftercare codes. There are no therapy-only codes in ICD-10. You know, we used to have therapy-only codes in the V section in ICD-9. Those are no more in ICD-10. Um, you will also find that for musculoskeletal issues, you have more sites and laterality to factor in. And laterality, of course, is right side or left side or bilateral in some cases. And in some of these conditions, such as primary osteoarthritis of the knees and hips, you will actually find that there is a bilateral code. And when it's appropriate, if you have a patient who has a condition in both 
knees, for example, and there is a combination code that says bilateral. If you use each site uh, independently, you are not coding properly according to guidelines. Guidelines tell us if there is a combo code that we should use that and not code each site separately. So we know in I-10 we have to know and be able to differentiate between acute and chronic conditions. There's guidance and we may have to query the physician in, in some cases to find out which is correct. We also know there are changes to pathologic fracture guidance and because as we talked about before there are no therapy only codes, um, the mappings and gems that people often use to get the right code and, and you know put a code in from I-9 and switch over to an I-10 code, those mappings and gems are going to send you to incorrect codes for therapy coding. As a matter of fact, let's look at that closely and talk about that. For therapy only coding in ICD-10, again, don't use the crosswalks to find a therapy only code. It will be incorrect. For example, in ICD-9, your V57.1 physical therapy code or V57.21 encounter for occupational therapy code, or V57.3 speech therapy, or V57.81 orthotic training with artificial limb, or V57.89 other therapies. That's the one we used to use when we had multiple therapies and no nursing was in. Um, all of those codes became obsolete in ICD-10. But if you look on mappings and gems, the crosswalk will reference all of those codes to Z51.89, which is encounter for other specified aftercare. The only problem with that is that the ICD-10 CM guidance says there are no applicable therapy only codes. So if you're using Z51.89, you are coding incorrectly. Okay, so don't use that. That's gonna uh, raise little red flags when CMS reviews. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about therapy-only coding. When you're coding therapy-only cases in ICD-10, you need to ask yourself, first of all, is therapy treating a disease process or a symptom? The code assigned should always be the disease or diagnosis causing the issue or symptoms, unless there has been no definitive diagnosis yet and you only have symptoms to code. For example, if you have a patient who has uh, Parkinson's, for example, and they have an unsteady gait, or they have difficulty walking, or any of those other diagnoses that we are accustomed to putting on the chart, that is incorrect coding because the symptoms are inherent to that disease. So even if therapy is involved, you only uh, use the diagnosis for Parkinson's. So when you're looking at coding disease processes in patients who require therapy, you need to query and train your therapist and your clinicians, your nurses and everyone to ask questions. And you may have to ask the physician, are the symptoms that I'm seeing, are those related to whatever disease process the patient has? Or I'm seeing symptoms, but I don't have anything documented about this diagnosis. Does the patient actually have this problem? And, and you'll need to query and justify and document all of that and then use the correct diagnosis code. But again, if the patient's having symptoms, the doctor has uh, let you know that they're working the patient up to see what the actual problem is and all you have are symptoms, then it would be appropriate in that case to use the symptoms only. All right, so again, are we looking at symptoms or disease process? When therapy involves a chronic condition, use the code for the diagnosed condition. Symptom codes are for use when the underlying problem is not known according to the ICD-10 CM guidance. Symptom codes come from chapter eight. That chapter is titled symptoms, signs, and abnormal clinical and laboratory findings not elsewhere classified. So again, even the title of the chapter tells you these are symptoms that are not classified with any other disease process or, or problem. That's why they're here. And all of these codes in chapter eight start with R. And R you can think of as rarely used because we rarely use symptoms when we code in home health care. The only time that we do that should be when we don't have a definitive diagnosis to deal with. Examples of therapy-related symptom codes are R25.0, abnormal head movements, R25.1, tremors, unspecified, 
R25-2, cramp and spasm, R25.3, fasciculation, um, and you would only use those uh, symptoms when there's not a disease process yet. You don't have a definitive diagnosis. However, when there's a diagnosis that includes symptoms as an integral part, that diagnosis should be coded rather than the symptoms. Some examples of therapy-related symptom codes in ICD-10 are R26, the abnormalities of gait. There's a lot more choices in ICD-10 for abnormality of gait. Uh, there are now six that represent specific types of gait problems, like R26.0 is an ataxic gait. R26.1 is a paralytic gait. R26.2 is difficulty walking, not elsewhere classified. R26.81 is unsteadiness on feet. R26.89 is other abnormalities of gait and mobility, and R26.9 are unspecified abnormalities of gait and mobility. Now, your therapist and you should have an understanding of the differences in ataxic and paralytic gait and difficulty walking and unsteadiness on feet, for example. Um, some of these disease processes or some of these abnormalities of gait, for example, come from cerebral um, injuries or cerebral issues, whereas others come from true musculoskeletal issues like MS. Uh, and again, the difference is, am I going to use any of these abnormality of gait codes? Well, that depends. Is the symptom that you're seeing inherent to a disease process the patient has or not? If they are inherent to the patient's disease process, you don't use any of these R codes. But again, if the patient does not yet have a definitive diagnosis and you're being sent out to do therapy, then you would use the proper um, abnormality of gait code from this list, perhaps. Okay, some examples of other therapy-related symptom codes are the R27 category. You have R27.0 ataxia. R27.8, other lack of coordination, and R27.9, unspecified lack of coordination. Uh, ataxia, as a matter of fact, is the lack of muscle control. It's usually due to injury to cerebellum, such as stroke, alcohol abuse, tumors, cerebral palsy, or multiple sclerosis, for example. So if the patient had a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, you wouldn't also code R27.0 ataxia because that's an inherent part of that disease process. All right, examples of therapy-related symptom codes more. We have R29.6 in this chapter. That's repeated falls. And we have guidance in ICD-10 that tells us that we are to use the R29.6 code for repeated falls uh, when the patient is falling and the reason for the fall is being investigated. So the patient's falling and we don't really know why, we're still trying to find that out, then this would be an appropriate code. If we know why the patient's falling because they have Parkinson's, this would not be an appropriate code. Also, we find out that the code R29.6 can be used with code Z91.81, history of falling or risk of falling, and we can use those together when appropriate. So one of the examples I give in my classes are uh, where I'm from in, in central Mississippi, a lot of seniors uh, have the sense of pride about them that they've never been to a doctor, they've never been in a hospital, they don't take medications. And, you know, it, it's happened before that we get patients to home care in that area that have gone to the doctor because they've been falling a lot lately and um, they don't know why. And the doctor see, you know, sees a primary care physician and the doctor suspects it may be Parkinson's or something else going on and they refer them to the neurologist. The neurologist can't see them for a couple weeks or so. And so we have had home health referrals before where we didn't have a definitive diagnosis. And so we have to use the symptom codes. And in that particular example, it would be appropriate to code R29.6 repeated falls and Z91.81 history of falling because the patient's falling, they're at risk to continue to fall, and we don't yet have a definitive diagnosis. The reason is being investigated. Although Z91.81's code title is history of falling, it is to be used when the patient has fallen in the past and or is at risk for future falls. And I only have and here, but the guidance 
also tells you to use that for risk of falls. All right, again, when that symptom is inherent to the disease diagnosis, code the disease rather than the symptom. So think about it in this respect. Is this a symptom or a disease that you're going to code? Would you code abnormality of gait or Parkinson's disease? Would you code difficulty walking or arthritis of the knees? Would you code ataxic gait or multiple sclerosis? Neuropathic gait or foot drop? Which one are you going to code? Therapists should document symptoms as due to documented diseases when possible. Investigate the reason for symptoms if it's not known or documented. In other words, you're probably going to have to query the physician in some cases. All right, let's talk specifically about arthritis coding in ICD-10. The arthritis codes have laterality in ICD-10, and we're to only code associated pain and stiffness if there's no established diagnosis of arthritis or other disease. And again, that makes sense, right? Because pain and stiffness is inherent to arthritis. We don't need to be repetitive and also code those symptoms. So you're going to need to know what type of arthritis the patient has. Is it infectious arthritis? Is it inflammatory, such as rheumatoid arthritis? Is it traumatic arthropathy? Is it osteoarthritis or degenerative joint disease, or is it gout? The arthritis codes do have laterality. As a matter of fact, some of these codes have bilateral combination codes. And if there is no bilateral code and both sides are affected, you should code each site separately. For example, here you have an M16.0 bilateral primary osteoarthritis of hip. So we wouldn't code M16.1 and M16.2 to show arthritis of the left hip and right hip because in this case we have a bilateral code. However, there's not a bilateral code for primary osteoarthritis of the shoulder and in that case we would have to code them separately so we would note that the patient has M19.011 arthritis right shoulder and M19.012 arthritis left shoulder. One of the biggest changes between I9 and I10 involves the coding of fractures, so let's cover that as well. Fractures are now coded in home health care. You'll need to know the site of the fracture, the type of the fracture, the cause of the fracture, and any related issues such as osteoporosis or neoplasm of the bone. The seventh character of the fracture codes will define the status of the healing, such as is it delayed, routine healing, is there a non-union or malunion? Uh, the seventh char character will also define the encounter timing, such as initial or subsequent or sequelae. Uh, it will also define open or closed fracture, and it, if it's a type of open fracture, you're going to use the Gustillo grade, uh, which tells you it's uh, 3A, 3B, and so on. And that seventh character will also define if it's displaced or non-displaced. Now, since we know physicians have been given a bit of leeway in the first year of transitioning to I-10, uh, the physicians only have to get in the correct family of codes in order to bill. However, we are not given that leeway, and so you may not always get the information that includes all of this. So ICD-10 has been kind enough to give us some defaults. Uh, many fractures, um, you won't have all the information, so we'll talk about what those defaults are in just a moment. Now, multiple fractures are coded and sequenced according to the severity of the fracture. So if the patient fell and they fractured their wrist and they also fractured a couple of vertebrae, um, then you're going to sequence those according to which one is causing the most issue, which one is most acute, which one is driving the care, and so on. And if you can't discover information needed regarding fractures in medical records and query, there are defaults in the guidance for ICD-10. For example, if it's not indicated if the fracture is displaced versus non-displaced, your default will be displaced. And if it's not indicated if the fracture is open versus closed, your default will be closed. Let's talk a little about pathologic fractures. A pathologic fractures can be caused by osteoporosis or neoplasms. In ICD-10, there's a guidance change as far as pathologic fractures, 
uh, in that we are allowed to assume a current fracture is due to osteoporosis when no cause is stated as due to another cause. What does that mean? If your patient has a fracture and they also have osteoporosis and the fracture would have happened in a way that a normal person who doesn't have osteoporosis would likely not have achieved a fracture, then you are to assume that they are related and code it as osteoporosis with the current fracture. There's a combo code and those are in the M80 category. The guidance goes on to tell us we should use this code even if the patient had a minor fall or trauma, if that fall or trauma would not normally cause a fracture in a normal healthy bone. So if the patient's trying to get up and use the walker and they fall back in the chair and get a fracture and they have osteoporosis, obviously that's going to be coded as a pathologic fracture. But you must know the type of osteoporosis and the patient has osteoporosis in order for this to be the case. All right. If the fracture is due to a neoplasm of the bone, it's coded as a pathological fracture in neoplastic disease. And you will also need to code the neoplasms. The sequencing, again, is going to depend on the reason for the encounter or the focus of care. So depending on if you're seeing the patient for the fracture or if you're seeing the patient for the neoplasm, that's what's going to guide your sequencing for those disease processes. All right, let's move into osteomyelitis coding. Osteomyelitis commonly occurs in diabetic patients, as we know. However, there is no manifestation pairing for diabetic osteomyelitis in I-10. In other words, it's not going to say diabetic osteomyelitis. So you're going to need to query when the patient has osteomyelitis and they have diabetes. Um, you need to find out if it's related and you can't just assume that. Now there is clarification pending right now um, that we should be able to find out later in the year from the coding clinic as to what we can and cannot assume about diabetes and several of the things such as osteomyelitis are in that uh, process of being defined. So stay in touch with your coding clinic and your decision health or whomever else will put that out as well here at Access, uh, but make sure that you keep up with what changes are being made because ICD-10 is very new and there will be many, many changes over the next few years as far as guidance. And for that reason, I often tell my classes as well to subscribe to the coding clinic and the um, uh, AHIMA websites and so on so that you can keep up with that information. And uh, of course, we will also put that information out at Access for free, but if you want the latest, greatest breaking news and keep up with how they decide and all of that, the coding clinic is a wonderful way to keep up with those processes. All right, so if you query and find out that osteomyelitis is due to diabetes, you're going to use diabetes codes that end in 0.69 followed by the osteomyelitis code. For example, if your patient's a type 2 diabetic, um, and they have osteomyelitis, that would be E11.69, type 2 diabetes mellitus with other specified complication, and then M86.671, other chronic osteomyelitis, right ankle and foot. And sometimes you would have these diabetes codes comboed with the diabetic foot ulcer code as well. So it wouldn't be uncommon to have both. All right, let's talk a little bit about muscle weakness coding. I want to talk specifically, there are two muscle weakness codes in ICD-10. The R53.1 weakness code, it tells us not to use that code to indicate muscle weakness. This is a general weakness code, and it can include symptoms like excessive tiredness or lacking energy or listlessness and sleepiness. Um, and it's usually used with cardiopulmonary diseases like flu and pneumonia and CHF and atherosclerotic heart disease, for, uh, for example. Um, if you're going to use this code to support your therapy, your documentation must establish the medical necessity because the patient can be weak, but, uh, you know, what is it that's going on with that patient that requires the number of therapy services that you're giving her or him? Uh, most people will resolve this general weakness 
uh, unless they have some major underlying and comorbid conditions, they'll get over this eventually and get back to normal without the help of therapy. So again, your documentation is really going to have to describe what's going on with that patient. Uh, maybe they're so tired, uh, they've, they've been falling, they're afraid to get up and move around, so they're just sitting around and their muscles are wasting or whatever else is going on. But your documentation is really going to have to be descriptive about what's going on. The other muscle weakness code that you have in ICD-10 is M62.81, and this is generalized muscle weakness, but it's a true muscle weakness in this case. This is the one that results from musculoskeletal disorders, neuromuscular disease, or degenerative disease. Manual muscle measurements are not required but measurable weakness must be documented. So if you're not going to do muscle grading uh, as your example of the measurement, then you've got to find some way to show where you were to begin with and how you progressed or, or, or the um, measurable weakness progression, how it's documented. So usually the best way to do that, of course, is with your manual muscle testing. If you can show the patient went from a three minus to a, you know, four out of four, that's a good deal. But if you don't have those measurements, it may be difficult to really uh, differentiate the patient's progress. Okay, so that's generally how you're going to be coding an ICD-10. So let's apply these principles in some of our practice scenarios. Are you ready? All right, scenario number one, you have a patient who's a 73-year-old male who is referred following a right total knee replacement. PT is ordered for post-op knee rehab, and nursing is ordered for assessment of the knee incision, which is puffy and slightly red and warm, but has steri strips in place. Nursing will also perform PT INRs every Monday and Thursday for warfarin therapy. The patient also has primary osteoarthritis of the left knee and spinal stenosis of the cervical spine with radiculopathy to the right shoulder and arm. All right, so let's look at the answers here. Your primary diagnosis is aftercare in this in this case. There is no complication like infection or dehiscence or abscess. Um, if you suspect that these redness and puffiness symptoms are perhaps due to infection, you would call and query the physician. But in this case, we didn't get any diagnosis of infection. So this is Z47.1, aftercare following joint replacement surgery. And there's guidance at that code to tell us to also code the presence of the artificial joint. That means you have to sequence that code just after Z47.1. So the second code is Z96.651, presence of right artificial knee joint. We also need to code the arthritis going on in the other knee. And thanks to ICD-10, we can easily show that this is on the other joint, the other knee. So the third code is M17.12, unilateral, primary osteoarthritis, left knee. The patient also has spinal stenosis, and that's definitely going to impact how well the patient rehabs with this no, uh, total knee. So your fourth code is M48.02, spinal stenosis, cervical region. And then we have two status codes at the bottom to show what's going on. Uh, and we have Z51.81, which is Encounter for Therapeutic Drug Level Monitoring, followed by Z79.01, Long-Term Current Use of Anticoagulants. Okay, let's do scenario number two. This patient is a 74-year-old female who was referred to home health following a left total hip replacement for traumatic arthritis of the left hip. The physician has ordered PT and OT for joint rehab. Let's look at our answer. This one's quite simple for many reasons. Number one, the traumatic arthritis um, has already been resolved by the joint replacement surgery. And the other thing we know and have learned is that there are no therapy-only codes. So in this case, you have only two codes, Z47.1, aftercare following joint replacement surgery, followed by Z96.642, presence of left artificial hip joint because again there's guidance at Z47.1 that tells you you must also code the artificial joint and so it must follow right after Z47.1. All right number three your patient is an 83 year old female who's referred for home health due to compression fractures of L4 and L5 
three after falling backward onto her bed trying to transfer to the bedside commode. She also has age-related osteoporosis and hypertension. She had a prior pathologic fracture of the hip a year ago. PT and OT are ordered for mobility and safe ADL training, and nursing is ordered for management of pain-related hypertension exacerbation. So we've got a lot going on with this lady. We've learned today that in this case, we are to assume that the fracture is due to the osteoporosis and that makes it a current pathologic fracture. And we're going to look at how we've coded this one. In this case, your primary diagnosis is M80.08XD, age-related osteoporosis with current pathological fracture of the vertebra. And that is subsequent encounter because the initial treatment has ended and we are following with subsequent treatment. We have the hypertension exacerbation due to pain. That's coded I-10. Then we have Z87.310. That's to show the personal history of a healed osteoporosis fracture. And then, of course, she fell backward. So we have Z91.81, history of falling. All right, scenario number four, your patient is a 58-year-old male with Parkinson's disease who's been falling several times in the past two weeks. PT and OT are ordered for evaluation and training on proper type of assistive device to enable safe mobility. So again, there are no therapy-only codes. What are we there for? We are there for Parkinson's disease, G20, and Z91.81, history of falls. We didn't also code the R code, which is uh, frequent falls, because we know why the patient is falling. It's not being investigated. The patient's falling because he has Parkinson's disease. All right, scenario number five, your patient's an 82-year-old female who's referred to home health following a hospital stay for E. coli pneumonia, which was caused by an exacerbation of her combined systolic and diastolic congestive heart failure. Query reveals this is acute on chronic heart failure. The physician has ordered nursing for teaching new medications and PT and OT for treatment of related weakness. The patient has very little energy and is drowsy throughout the day, even though she's on oxygen at two liters per minute continuously. So how are we coding that one? There's a combo code in this case for the pneumonia and the organism together, and that is now coded to J15.5 in the primary uh, position for pneumonia due to E. coli. Our secondary codes are I50.43, acute on chronic combined systolic and diastolic congestive heart failure. In this case, we use the R53.1 weakness code because weakness is not necessarily inherent to a person who has pneumonia and heart failure, and it is on this patient, and so we coded that. And last, we have Z99.81 for our dependence on supplemental oxygen. Okay, our last scenario for the day, we have a patient who's referred to PT and nursing due to gait abnormality described by the physician as unsteadiness on feet. Patient has experienced repeated falls and has a neurology appointment in three weeks. So we don't know what's going on with this patient yet. Uh, we're doing a workup to find out. So as we've learned in our guidance, in this case, all we have are symptom codes. So the doctor has called it unsteadiness on feet. That's what we're going to have to code as well. And so we use R26.81, unsteadiness on feet, followed by R29.6, repeated falls. And then we are learning, as we've learned today, we're also going to use Z91.81, history of falling, because when it is appropriate, you can use the R code for falls and the Z code for falls together. I hope you've enjoyed uh, listening to the therapy and musculoskeletal coding session today. We're glad that you chose access as your educational resource, and I'm really glad that you were here with me. If you ever have questions uh, or you want to reach out to me to get some clarification, I'm happy to help you. You can reach me on my phone number that's listed here on the screen, as well as by email. That's jgibson at access.com, and we are very glad to have you join us again today. And stay tuned because part seven will be coming of our series, and that will be 
uh, neurological and mental codes and how to apply those disease process codes in ICD-10. So again, thank you very much, and I hope you have a wonderful day. And as always, I thank you for what you do in the home health industry, regardless of your title, because we know if you weren't there every day doing your job, we would have disabled persons and seniors who deserve the care that you give who would not be getting that care. So thank you again for all that you do, and have a wonderful day, okay? This is Jennifer. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining our webinar today. We know that your time is valuable and are happy you chose to spend it with Access. At Access, we're proud to offer a variety of training resources to keep you in the know on industry news and updates. You can register for additional trainings and watch on-demand training videos through our software or at access.com, where you can also find tutorials, online manuals, and answers to frequently asked questions. We're always just a call or click away. Feel free to call us at 866-795-5990 or email us at support at access.com. All of our expert client experience representatives have a home health care background. They've been in your shoes and know the industry inside and out. Join the conversation and connect with us on our social channels. We'll keep you up to date with what's going on in the industry and share resources to help you grow your business and improve your patient outcomes. Thank you again for your time today and for choosing Access, your provider of complete home health care services, software, and solutions.